you came in, Dick Vermeil's the coach, then it's Herm Edwards, um, and then it's Todd Haley, then it's Romeo Cornell, then it's Andy Reid. I mean, th- talk about that journey for you because you're able to remain um, a steadying force in the Chiefs organization and playing at a Pro Bowl level no matter kind of who was in charge here, obviously Andy Reid takes over and things have been steady since then, but it was a, it was a rough go playing for all that, those many coaches. How difficult was that? Uh, it was difficult. Uh, the reality is when, when we lost our, uh, Lamar Hunt, when we lost him in 2007, you know, it was a big blow to the organization and now trying to first establish management because uh, Carl Peters, uh, Carl Peterson was no longer going to be around, and Clark was now in position to, you know, establish the franchise. And you know, different different coaches. Uh, I love Todd Haley, to be honest with you. I love his demeanor. Um, uh, the GM Scott Pioli, <laughs> love Scott, <laughs> micromanager. If <laughs> it's just understanding these guys, you know, Scott's different than John. So. Those guys were really tough. They reminded me reminded me when I was at Penn State. Joe was not easy on us, you know. Simple little rules, and if you didn't abide, you didn't play. It was almost the same with, uh, wouldn't say Haley, but more with Scott. You know, Haley was back and forth. He'll be someday. He'll ha- be happy with you, and you would think you guys are really cool. Other days, he'll be the coach. So you had to kind of know your role with him. Um, but I, I enjoyed playing for Scott Fioli. Uh, Romeo Cornell, I couldn't ask for a better coach at that time because he loved the players. So long you loved football, he was not going to baby you. He wanted for you to play. It's just, you know, one year is not going to turn nothing over, especially in this league and how hard it is. Um, Coach Reed came in and changed the culture immediately. There was so much doubt in our mind because of so many games we lost that were close. And Coach Reed came, and would, once we got down, you can see he's not even pressed. It's like, what's wrong? Coach is going to to lose this game. And we end up winning the game, and it's surprising. And it's like, over time, we started to understand how he wanted to do business wasn't what we was doing. You know, workouts were hard. Um, yeah, being on time is very important. You know, being accountable, being available. Um, he made anything that players wanted, you got. So he knew that you should show up on Sunday. If you, you guys want to rim, you want to shoot balls, shoot, sure, put the rim in the locker room. Or you want video games, you want this, you want that, you got it. So long Sunday came and you realized what was at stake and you played well, coach wouldn't even bother you. He wouldn't, he's so, he's so good at it. The hardest part of playing for coach was camp, um, eight o'clock in the morning, we're on the field. <laughs> so if you're one of those guys who like to do the other things, you probably won't make the team. <laughs> so that was hard. First thing in the morning, we did the hardest thing. And the next hardest thing is his practice are not hard. It's long. Yeah. So you're on the field for three hours. It's not like he's, you know, making you, you know, run, run, run. It's more like mentally we have to be involved because that's the game. It's a up and down, up and down. You just got to be in tune in practice. And it changed the culture immediately. If you couldn't play, he didn't even bother you. He got the next guy in. That was the coach. And it was almost like before, I would be so hurt. And they're like, oh, Tommy, you got to go. I got to take a shot. And I'll go. Coach, if you, if you can't play, coach is like, cool, get well. The next guy, he brought good players around that. If you can't play, you may lose your job because this guy's good. <laughs> this <is the> guy <laughs> that came up is just as good. So, you know, coach actually did so much for me. My last year, I was a bit hurt, and I think Coach knew my, my stat as far as playing and practicing. You know, at that time, I, I don't think I've missed practice, and I've been out games. So, but I was hurt. I was getting hurt in the game, and, and Coach pretty much saw that if he plays this year, he may not be able to walk. Maybe he hurt himself because he just – they knew the signs behind what was going on. I, I was just mentally intact. Like, I'm going to play. Every Sunday, I don't care. I'm going to play. So he kind of – he helped me out. He paid me a lot of money. He sat me down, brought me back, played six, six games. And we still talk to this day. There's no animosity towards this idea. And um, my family always be like, oh, he should have kept you in. You would have, you know, creeped up on 100 sacks. I'm like, bro, I don't care if it's – I don't care about sacks today. I'm walking today. I'm playing with my kids today. You know, who did that for me? Coach. 
another coach may have kept plugging it and I probably wouldn't be walking today. So it's a lot of respect that goes for Coach Reed because he's done it for so long and he knows how to treat the players. That's great to hear that he did that for you and you have this great quality of life now. And uh, going back to 2006, you're drafted, you come in, your first defensive coordinator, Gunther Cunningham, sadly, uh, he's recently passed away. But what did he do for your game coming in as a rookie? <clears throat> Gunther was different, very harsh, you know, a very militant way of working. Um, there was no filter the way he went about the business. And I actually, I, I embraced it because it was a new style. I came from Joe, you can't cuss at the players. And when I got there, I started seeing, you know, players cussing at coaches, coaches cussing at players, and I couldn't relate to it. But over time, I realized what my mind was starting to do. These things are supposed to make you do the opposite thing so we can get you out of here. <laughs> so I kind of peeped game. And at one time, I remember Gunther kept putting me in the, I guess they call it the either head up on the tight end. It's a six technique, maybe. Um, so I'm, I didn't like it because I, I want to be on the edge coming. And I felt like early in my career, I, I didn't succeed because of that six technique. I'm playing the tight end to the, to the tackle every time. I'm like slow on the ball. And one time me and him got in a huge argument because he came in a room talking all this linebacker talk. I said, Uncle, just put me on the outside. I bet you will win games. And he cussed me out the whole meeting. <laughs> oh, God. That's got the, got the whole meeting. All I could do is put my head down and just be sorry. You know, just <laughs> that I said something. <laughs> oh, wow. But, That's... Yeah, Gunther loved me, and, I, you know, I loved him. And his, his daughter and I, we used to talk all the time as friends. Well, um, another guy that certainly helped lay this foundation, and there was recently an E60 on, uh, Alex Smith, who – suffered a horrific leg injury, of course, his first year with the Redskins. You played with him uh, for the better part of four seasons there in Kansas City. Again, another guy there that helps lay the groundwork that's not there for the Super Bowl win, but he's every bit a part of it as you guys are. Just talk about him as a person and kind of what your thoughts were when, when you heard about the injury and maybe if you've seen the E60 and kind of what he's overcome. It's insane. I haven't seen the E60. Um, when I heard it happened – you know, I wasn't happy about it because he's a competitor and he he definitely wanted to continue to prove that he can play at this high level and actually win a Super Bowl. Um, as we, at, one thing I, I have high, high respect for Alex because a lot of guys in his position don't know how to treat that position. They don't know how to go about the business. And Alex was such a professional, regardless if we won or lost. He knew how to conduct himself in the locker room around the guys he knew how to talk to the guys. He knew what not to say to the guys. You would ask Alex some questions, and he won't answer you because he knows it's not for you to be in this conversation. And, I, you know, sometimes we, people in that position would start talking and start saying, oh, they, you know, we should have won this, we should have did this. And Alex was so good about his role. When he, it, 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 We all loved it, and we all felt like, man, he could do better than that. He should do this and do this. But he's a professional. You know, We don't know what's being asked of him. And he handled it so well, and he continued to do it till he got hurt. When I saw he got hurt, and then I, I saw a snippet of his leg now where, you know, there's a, uh, I don't know what it is. But, yeah, it, you know, it's hard to look at because, you know, that could be me. And I'm looking at former quarterback that he's a quarterback. He shouldn't hurt his leg like that. And, and then he's, you know, going through it. But he's a warrior, and he'll get through this one. And I, I, this guy is a Hall of Famer, regardless of what people say. I, I, in my book, the way he conducted himself, the way he won games, he's able to complete the long passes. He had great players. For whatever it's worth, this is how the cards unfold for for majority of the people in the NFL. When I got there, Casey Redman hadn't been to a playoff game for 15 years. He'd been there maybe one or twice. So, you know, it's hard. It, this is one of the hardest sports. So for, for what it's worth, I mean, Alex, he, he, he did extraordinary as a player, three teams, and, and I don't know where he sits in stats, but it has to be high. <laughs> it has to be. I mean, the guy, he used to go touchdown. He, he won big games, you know. So um, we're rooting for him. I hope he can make it out. I hope he doesn't play football anymore, though. I hope right. He, yeah. Well, Tomba, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about your journey because your, your life post-football 
has uh, has been so prolific and you've got it seems like just a wonderful family and you're doing so great and it's so good to see you there and your music the album tomba juice is tremendous i hope everybody will check that out on spotify right now all the listeners need to be downloading it as we speak as soon as the interview's over uh but just talk a little bit about your journey because growing up in liberia you you escape uh at age 10 your your dad is a uh, chemistry professor and you wind up getting to go to college to play football at Penn State. You become an all Big Ten performer and a first round draft pick in the NFL. How did all that kind of fall in line for you? Because, you know, it seems like your life path, it's, it, it was a million to one that that could have happened to you. And yet you put in the, the determination, put in the work for that. Uh, your family situation, you know, your dad is perseverance, getting you guys here to America had to help. Just kind of t- take us through your journey, man. It was, it, it's, it's been amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't mean to offend anyone. I think I will start with my faith. Um, first, I, I have a strong belief system and it works, you know, so we'll start with that. Uh, we grew up in the church and my mom is a minister. My stepfather is a minister. He was an ex-Muslim and he became uh, a minister back uh, 30 years ago. And he, he did that for, he been well, he's still a minister. But during the war, I can only credit this one to the, the, the maker, the creator, because the, the situations that we were placed in, uh, the odds are against us that we make it up, make it out alive, alive, just to make it out alive, not to yeah. even be a football player, just to make it out alive. So to, to flee the country and then get and get to the Ivory Coast and then my dad be able to get in contact with my dad and then my dad have the, the spirit in him to say, those are my children, not just I had kids. Those are my children. I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes for them to at least get an opportunity and come back and battle in, in immigration in, in Abidjan and then go to uh, uh, Ghana. And then Ghana, uh, you know, finally we did all the testing and they allow us to come. We got to the country. I'm 10 years old. I can't read. I can't write. I'm placed in the fifth grade. Um, so I'm um, pretty much humility is right there. You know, I have to stand up in class with a child, another kid who's going to read with me verbatim because I didn't grow up in the system. You know, I couldn't read a book in the fifth grade. So I'm in uh, ESL, second language, you know, first four years, I'm struggling in school. You know, as time went by, we were able to catch on uh, all the siblings that got here. And I, I guess... One thing that was dynamic was I enjoyed playing sports. So I, would, I, would, I played basketball, I played uh, soccer. Football was a gift, again, if from the creator because I didn't grow up knowing, you know, Reggie White or mm-hmm. uh, Eric Thomas. I, I, you know, I'm new to the country, 94. So 2000, I say, I'm in high school, 98, and my gym teacher said, you have to play because he was the defensive coordinator. He said, you have to play. So I played and I did well. I actually wasn't going to play the following year because I had just won the free throw contest at Keystone Bas- Basketball Camp in Pennsylvania. So I'm already hyped. Like I'm about to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> you talk about thousand guys. I mean, yeah. you know, listen, there may be one. But, you know, the coach again, the basketball coach said, no, you're going to play football. You know, you're going to play football. And I remember Mr. Malone saying that to me, and I played. Now I backfired. I didn't play basketball after my sophomore year. I skipped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm playing basketball. <laughs> and my, my, my football coach told me, yeah, you don't need to play basketball. There's a risk. Play your senior year because after you're done, you, you sign and all of that. Cool. So I, I didn't play. I played football, and I didn't understand what was going on. I was highly regarded in the state of New Jersey. I just didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know what a scholarship was. I was still understanding the language that I'm speaking at that level and everything that's going on. Like, I didn't know you had to pay to go to school. None of these things are really, you know, you're coming from Liberia, you don't, this is not life, you know. (laughs) I get all these scholarships, over 65 scholarships to go anywhere in the state. I picked Penn State because of Joseph Paterno. Uh, I think he was a stand-up guy, and he was very real with the players. He, he looked at the guys and said, "Hey, listen, if this is not the place for you, you don't you don't need to come." You know, I was I was recruited by Miami. That told me, "Listen, we got gang of guys here. You're gonna redshirt." Even Joe told me, "You're gonna redshirt." Um, uh, Syracuse told me, 
who will play you because Freeney is leaving. We need someone to fill in. So, you know, it was between those two. I took a visit all the way to Southern California. That's when Lean Kiffin was just maybe like, you know, an assistant and he was, and I was considering it, but for some reason it was Joe. Mm-hmm. Joe didn't, I went, when I went on his visit, it was the wackest visit. Like we didn't, there was no party for me to be all happy about. It, it was no, I would take you here, you know, fool you. It was, Joe was being very real. I slept in the dorm with the guys. I hung around the players and I just enjoyed that atmosphere and said, wow, this is how it will be. Fine. I'm going here. School was hard. Um, I won't hide. There was some, there was some, I, I got to credit some of these women that, that choose to be around. <laughs> these football players. <laughs> they definitely, um, my girlfriend at the time definitely helped me with my schoolwork in, in understanding how things would, you know, would go. So, you know, to credit that to her, she was a good soul at the time for me being around, um, she helped me, but it was hard. I had to still take my tests. We had first dibs on tutors. It was hard. And I, I, I don't want to say it came easy. I worked at it, graduated with this broadcast journalism degree. And that's fine. <laughs> I started out with science, computer science. But, I, you know, it's too tough when you're playing sports and you know, you like girls. And <laughs> too many going on. So I just stuck with the talking thing. And, you know, being drafted, uh, Herm Edwards and Carl Peterson were the, the two G two. I, Herm was probably the only coach that came. I think there were other GMs, but Herm and, and Carl came to my workout and they, they brought me on a visit and they highly favored me because you was looking at um, Manny Lawson who runs a four, four. I mean, the guy, you, you remember Manny, you can fly. Oh. Then you got the big guy, uh, he was our, the number one pick. I forget his name. Uh, 2006 dress. Big guy. Big defensive end. Mario Williams, isn't it? Yes, yes. So you got those guys. You got Bunkley. You got some really good players coming out in the draft. And for whatever it was worth, I mean, Herm really believed in my talent, as well as Bunker and, and um, Crumright. Crumright was my positional coach. Tim Crumright. They loved, up. They loved my work ethic. And, and when I got to the Chiefs, another struggle because of all of those different, different coaches and how to adjust in, in this program. But, the, you know, the, the journey is it's a learning experience. Obviously, no one wins here. We, we continue to just progress by learning. And, you know, I, again, I give it to the creator that, that placed me in this position so I can be able to shed some of my light with you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. We think that as well. Uh, you come in as defensive end. You're with Jared Allen. He gets traded in 2008. And then they switch. Todd Haley comes in 2009, switch to a 3-4. And you're moved outside linebacker. What was that transition like for you? I was used to it. Um, being in college, I got there as a DN. They put me at defensive tackle, nose tackle. So I played nose tackle for two years. And then after that, coach said, okay, we need to put him at DN. I played DN. So it was kind of a similar situation, just having to adapt. The hardest part was understanding that I have to cover someone in a way that I never did that before. There's a tree of routes that they're going to run. And I'm just not, you know, I'm not accustomed to it. I struggled with, with it. But... I enjoyed the position because it put me outside of the tight end so I can yeah. rush. And it gave me leverage to at least get some sacks. Um, Jared leaving was a blow to me because he was our best pass rusher at the time. I could have only learned more by being around because when he left, you, you know, his, you can see how he, he did it. When he left the program, he, he just, you know, skyrocketed. So it was a blow to me. So I had to be a veteran and that's when everything started going this way because you know, everyone is getting fired. And now the third year guy is supposed to be the best guy. But it, it definitely opened my mind into understanding where whatever position you're placed in, you just need to embrace it and continue to progress through it because I guess your will is the one that's going to succeed over the fact that you don't know what you're doing. Just rush. Just try to be with the guy. No one knows if you know what you're doing or not. Just, you yeah. know, you got to just fool them or act it. <laughs> Well, Tom, one of the last things here before we let you go, just got to talk about some of these playoff games you were in. Uh, 2015, uh, Rule 14, you guys uh, take on the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, there's a big comeback from the Colts. You guys lose 45-44. Uh, 
Uh, you guys do get a playoff win against the Houston Texans, 30 to nothing. Then you go on to lose to the Patriots. And then you guys only give up uh, six field goals, no touchdowns to the Steelers, but you lose the game. And then Marcus Mariota throws a touchdown pass to himself. Derek Johnson blows up Mariota, but they call it forward progress. What's going on here with these, some of these losses? It's crazy. Uh, if, if, there's, if there's politics in football, then I guess you talked about it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I agree. <laughs> because those are devastating losses, to, especially to the, the, the elders. You know, Derek Johnson, me, uh, Dustin, we want to win at this time. We know time is ticking. And then you got coach, a coach like Andy Reid who comes in and we're able to do things like make the playoff, come back, win six, seven, eight games in a row and make the playoff after losing four or five games. I mean, the things that we were doing with Andy was just extraordinary. But, again, if there's anything to say about politics or football, let it be said, for us, we knew we enjoyed that time because it was like something we never had. It's like having a new child. We're in the playoff. The world's watching us. We are actually decent football players that now people get to see. So, you know, whatever happened, it happened, but we enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I, my knees were shot for that Colts game. But I taped it up, uh, took my shot. Let's go. <laughs> I remember you had blood coming off the chin strap all over your jersey. That's crazy. Yeah, it was fun time. It's fun time. And, you know, for the young guys, I think what they need to take from uh, this is that they don't need to feed into what's going on upstairs with management because the game is bigger than us. And if you start really researching in, in anything, you start understanding, wow, <laughs> it is really bigger than us. It's, it's, it doesn't even start with a win. It starts with humanity, you know. So when you start looking at that picture, it's like, oh, man, like, Go enjoy the game. If you can win, win. If you can yeah. get sacks, get sacks. Whatever they do is up to them. We play. <laughs> well, Tomba, God bless you and your uh, run here. Six times Pro Bowler, um, all Big Ten at, uh, at Penn State. What a career. What a life. What a journey. Uh, before we let you go, last thing. Uh, your last year in the league happens to be Patrick Mahomes' rookie year. He comes in. The Chiefs draft him 10 overall. They move up to do it. You were around him probably just uh, for a short amount of time, but – what did you see in Patrick Mahomes and did you kind of foresee that he would sort of take the league and, and, and the country by storm the way he has? Okay. The way he did it. No, I, I can't say <laughs> I knew you had a really good player with you. Uh, you know, just watching him in practice, he'd never complain. He'd get out there and just in, enjoy and just have fun. And usually guys are trying to work for the position like, Oh, Alex is, I got to start. Patrick never had that style of mind. He was in practice and just enjoying himself playing. And I think that's the time I watched more because I wasn't playing and I'm watching and I'm yeah. like, this kid's good. This kid's good. And then immediately once the release, you know, that year was done to release me and Alex, everyone was out. And I'm like, that kid's good. Knowing we have Tariq though, in the back of my head, I'm always like, hey, Tariq, yeah. this kid's good. And, you know, but what he's been able to do in, in the style he did it with Coach, let's not forget Coach again. You know, Coach, uh, having Coach is a key. It's, it's a huge key. There's a lot of talent that come in the league, but Patrick is blessed to have someone that, that knows the knowledge of football, not just, you know, I played or I'm a coach or I know what to do when I call plays. He knows football. It's like chess. He knows it. He knows how to win games quickly if he wants. So I was already sold that, no, this guy will win a championship here because of coach, though. I mean, not just because of, of, of Patrick. Nothing against Patrick. He's a talented player. He does exactly what it, that's needed from that position. But to have a, a, a master coach like Andy Reid, you know, it really makes, it makes you look bigger than what you are, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 